Hey, Mark Pollock, how are you doing today? Doing well, Paul. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for coming on today. What we want to do in a quick 30 minutes here is take some people through good stuff that they can use to tame 4G, 5G wireless in your city. And I know you're doing excellent work with a number of cities, and you built a lot of that work uh, with some other attorneys here in the Bay Area. But we really appreciate what you're doing to help these cities and your time to explain a little bit of that today. What we're going to do right now is just go through a couple of slides uh, to show them some of the basics. Now, obviously, I know you and admire you. You have been an attorney in Napa for some time. You're an environmental attorney, and you are helping them get through really good strategies. And you have a nice cadre of cities, Beverly Hills, Newport Beach, South Lake Tahoe, Napa, Santa Rosa, Berkeley, Davis. These people really appreciate that you're helping them get a little control of the situation. Harry Lehman is another gentleman you've worked with, and he's got multiple litigations uh, against the wires companies and has done excellent work in Santa Rosa and Thousand Oaks right now and deep litigation. And you've built on a lot of some of the foundations of stuff he, you and I have, he and you have discussed. And so what we're gonna do is say, one of the things that's happening here is people have to understand that regulating the vertical distance off the ground the horizontal distance, how far away from homes, and the maximum effective radiated power is a very important possibility for all cities. That's because of the way the antenna pattern works. And you're highest when you're in line with the main beam of the antenna. That means your second and third story bedroom windows. So what, you, what I've seen for sure is that no one wants a cell tower of any G. Now, when I mean any G, it's either 4G or 5G or 3G. They're all just the generations of technology. But what's important here is the amount of power that it outputs, no matter what the G. So nobody wants that 10 to 100 feet from their home. And we have on this slide three pictures. We have one tower that's 40 feet, another that's 10 feet, another that's 20 feet from homes. And this is way too close when you consider the amount of power that's coming out of those antennas. These are essentially macro tower antennas and macro tower power levels, way too close to homes. And that's why we need to get a little control over all this. Well, the hook that you're finding is that when they come in this close to homes, and you can see the plan on the right is for Scottsdale, Arizona. And that's just yikes, <laughs> who wants all that? Well, you know, that image to the left is showing macro towers in your neighborhood. Well, it's telling you the truth. Even though they don't look like that, they put out that kind of power. And that is your biggest problem. So Mark, what you really do help with all these cities is to lower the problems these people are really having. These are real hazards that these families face by putting cell towers right outside their homes. You get safety, privacy, and property value hazards. The safety hazards are because of radio frequency, microwave radiation, which is the broad categories, EMF, you know, electromagnetic fields, but it's inclusive of all the radiation that's coming out of these towers. What are they doing? They're essentially combining a data stream from fiber optic, and they're mushing that together with electricity to send it up a pole and spray it through the air at your house. That's the problem that we're having. And unfortunately, there are real damages and harms that come from these kinds of exposures when they're way below what the FCC guideline might be. So it's just terrible that all we need is 0 0.1 watt coming off the tower for phone calls, but they're putting things out as high as 22,000 watts, just way too high. The privacy is because they actually are able to mine all your data. They can watch you walk around inside your house. They can do all kinds of things when they bounce microwaves off of your house. And the property values are that people don't wanna buy houses next to these things. That's 20 to 30% off the price of your house. So what do we see here? This is actually uh, a very important part of the Telecommunications Act, and it's known as 332C7B4. People know this as the citing clause, and it's talking about the special permissions 
that the wireless company has for preemption. And the important part about this preemption clause is you have to go with the plain language of the law. It's not about interpretation. It's what it actually says. So we should read it to understand that it really has to do with environmental effects, which are not health effects. So it says, no state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless facilities, that means cell towers, on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities, the cell towers, comply with the commissions, the FCC's, regulations concerning such emissions. What was interesting is when they, they wrote this, uh, there was no guideline in existence. Uh, they waited for the FCC to pick it six months later. But the intent uh, was to make sure there would never be any problems uh, for people with safety. And really, when it comes to health effects, you know, everything that's happening inside someone's skin is totally different than what's happening out there in the environment. And so it really does not say in the plain language anything to do with health effects. It only deals with environmental effects, and again, with radio frequency, microwave radiation emissions. That's what we're talking about, and that's why Mark can help so many people when you look at the insurance aspects, because it's really injury from radio frequency microwave radiation, which is the issue, right, Mark? That's correct, Paul. So cities are attempting to insulate themselves from uh, the potential of uh, lawsuits against the cities resulting from this exposure or these exposures. Oftentimes at public hearings, people are told, don't talk about the health effects, don't talk about the environmental effects because we're preempted and we can't consider those things. What you can counter with is you can and you should consider those things for several reasons. One is that the city can regulate the operation of these facilities. The other reason is that the city has the legitimate right to require insurance. And they're currently doing that under master license agreements and under urgency ordinances. They're requiring general liability coverage and they're requiring indemnity. The but problem, that insurance isn't quite good enough, right? It's just covering some, but not all. That's the problem. The problem is that the general liability policy of insurance, beginning with Lloyd's of London all the way down, has what's called a pollution exclusion clause, clause 32. And under that clause, it describes electromagnetic fields and RF generally as a pollutant and it excludes coverage. Accordingly, members of the public need to drive home to their city council that they need to require a policy of insurance from the telecom company without a pollution exclusion. And as I understand it, the insurance company did all of their analysis way back in 2011, 12, and they made all their statements and exclusions then. It's not just Lloyd's of London, it's Swiss RE, AM Best, all the big insurance companies have this same exclusion, right? That's correct, Paul. And after the city signs a master license agreement with the, with the telecom, the telecom will produce uh, a document called Certificate of Liability Insurance, and that will list the policy, and it will tell who the insured is, oftentimes listing the city as an additional insured under the policy. And it will also list that there is a pollution exclusion, and that needs to be driven home to the city management as a method of getting the information about impact in front of the city council, in front of the planning commission, and having them require pollution exclusion free policy coverage. All right, so if I understand this, it's kind of a joint venture, right? You have your public rights away that are essentially being um, run by your city, and they're going into business with the wireless company, and they're saying, hey, we don't want any insurance problems with this, but they're not being careful enough. 
And if there's an actual injury that comes forward and you actually name the city, then they can't necessarily get the coverage and they're going to be holding the bag financially. And this could bankrupt a city, right? That's precisely why at the bottom of this slide, you can see it says avoid telecom bait and switch WTF permitting. So typically what happens is the city will enter into a franchise agreement or a master license agreement. And there will be a company like GTE Mobility DBA Verizon Wireless. And when the certificate of insurance is produced, it will be a different entity than the one that signed the contract. Okay, so it's a little shell game. It will be an out-of-state entity, an entity incorporated in Delaware or set up uh, in Nevada. And the certificate of insurance insures that entity. So the question then becomes, if some other entity is doing the installing and someone gets killed or injured or is arguably hurt and made ill by the emissions from uh, the hardware or uh, the equipment, then who gets sued? It will probably be the entity that's do doing the operating. So it's imperative that the risk manager for the city ensure that whoever the operator is, is insured with proper coverage. Otherwise, the insurance company will deny liability coverage and the city will not be protected. Well, large companies know how to do this. So what they're trying to do is keep you from piercing the corporate veil and keeping big Verizon and big AT&T away from these liabilities. Liabilities they talk about to their investors all the time, but things they're trying to essentially make the city shoulder this liability. That's the worst part of all this. The city might get caught here by not being careful enough. Precisely. And if you see um, item three on the slide, beware of the tricks that telecoms use to avoid proper insurance. One of those tricks is offering the city indemnity in lieu of insurance and then posting a shell company to be the indemnitor so that in the event that there are lawsuits or there is recovery on behalf of injured people, now you've got a shell company and not a major corporation that's holding the bag. And the city finds out at that point that the bag is empty. So one way to combat this, I've heard, you've, you and I have talked about this, is if you actually require as part of your application process to have whatever entity is signing these agreements or doing the permits list, the board of directors right there on the application or the MLA and the assets of the corporation. So you're very clear about with which entity you're doing business today, right? Correct. And I would also suggest that uh, the city needs to require an actual copy of the policy of insurance, not just simply a certificate of liability insurance, which is a one page document. Okay, well, I'm just so happy that I bumped into somebody like you that can read all those big books behind you to get this thing done right, because we want to help these cities and you're doing it, man. So thank you so much. That was really clear. Thank you. I really appreciate you uh, explaining that. Thanks for the chance, Paul. Okay, thanks again, Mark. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay, take care. Okay, I just wanted to come back to this slide because it was really important when you think about the insurance here, okay? What we have all to the right is we have a bunch of dots on a map and they're different colors because these are different companies that are targeting these different poles. So this is when AT&T and T-Mobile and Verizon all grab these poles, and this is what it's gonna look like. That's how dense it could be. Now, when they first started building out this network, they didn't even dream of coming into the neighborhoods because it was never the intent of the act to actually put 50-foot towers in residential neighborhoods. We know that by reading the conference report. And it says specifically, we don't intend that if they're going to put a commercial tower somewhere, that they also have to allow a 50-foot tower in a residential district. So this is completely beyond the original intent of the act. What did they want to do? They wanted a nationwide network for making phone calls, emergency calls. 
And so that's why they grabbed the hillsides and put a bigger tower and they wafted it into the signal into your town. So it was never up close and personal in your bedroom. It was all coming at a very long distance. Well, now they're coming in close and now they've got too much power. And this is where you're gonna get injuries from radio frequency microwave radiation. And this is why now the insurance is so important to have. Now, when you take a look at power coming out of an antenna, there are a lot of ways to talk about it. But what the, uh, the industry does is they look at the power just as it leaves the antenna with something called effective radiated power. And it's a little complicated, but you just multiply two numbers together. You say, what's the maximum power input in watts? And then I apply an antenna gain to it. That's just a way for them to say, I wanna direct the signal a little further out horizontally, as opposed to in a big sphere, right? We wanna be a little more efficient that way. So often antenna gain will increase it somewhere around eight times, 10 times, 12 times. So you're gonna multiply the maximum power input times the antenna gain. That's what is effective radiated power. That's what leaves the antenna and that leads then to microwave radiation exposures out there in the environment. So you really can go back and cap the effective radiated power so that it matches what they already do at the FCC. They cap the power coming out of a Wi-Fi router right, that stuff you buy at Best Buy and, and you know, maybe Costco, you read that little pamphlet that comes with it, right? And they tell you a couple things, no more than 0.1 watt, because we don't want you to interfere with your next door neighbor or anything out there in the street. And they also tell you, you can't put it outside. Well, why? Well, because it will interfere with everything. So if you took your Nighthawk router, with its four inch high antenna, you know, not very tall, and stuck it on top of a utility pole, what would happen? That'll go down the block a half a mile, that will give you five bars on a cell phone, and everybody can make a call. So that way, your cell tower can be cut down in size. What are they today? At 7,000, 20,000 watts, they're 50 feet from your home, they're tanks in your neighborhood. What do you want them to be? You want it to be squirt guns, okay? You actually want to just say, hey, let's cap it at 0 0.1 watt, give us just enough power for phone calls, and that's enough. And when it's time to do video and gaming and streaming, then you can actually get your signal through fiber optic cable directly to your house. That's the way to get out of this box. So these are good ideas that your city can use when they start regulating vertical, horizontal, and power the effective radiated power, the stuff that comes right out of the antenna. We wanna thank Mark for coming on. He really shared a lot of good strategies that cities can use in order to tame this 4G, 5G rollout. And what we're seeing is the insurance angle is one of the strongest things you can do. We have a final slide here just to show you that one of the threats that wires companies make to cities all the time is, oh, we don't wanna sue you over this. You, know, you better go along with this. And that's just a bunch of bullying because in reality, it's not that big of a deal. You have to understand that when a wires company sues a city, they cannot sue for financial damages. You're not gonna get any extra payments from the city to the wires company. And they can't collect any monetary rewards for even their attorney's fees at all. And so all they're gonna be able to get is an injunction to build the permit. That's all they get. But if you're good at how you say no, they can't even get that because you can tie your reasons and your findings to things that are within your city's police powers. And those are things that tie back to the general plan and the protection of the quiet enjoyment of streets. And of course, protecting the health and safety of the residents. That's all very important and things that they can do.